And such like that. And uh, yeah, chapter 9 of John, we've just finished up chapter 8, but we're going to use the end of chapter 8 as our beginning, our springboard into chapter 9 as the uh, things just progress along here. As the Lord Jesus has been teaching in the temple, now he's moving out, going away from the temple area. So we'll have a look at that. We'll have a word of prayer first. Father in heaven, we just thank you, Lord, for this time for us to study your word lord we just pray that you will uh, guide us and help us with it lord help us to understand the holy spirit move upon us and uh, we just thank you and we pray all things in jesus christ's name amen okay let's have a look here so what we want to do is just back up just consider uh, a couple things in um, verse 59 of chapter 8 first of all we saw that there was a problem with the uh, Pharisees, uh, the Jews, when it says the Jews, it's usually talking about the Pharisees and uh, those that were in the, in the leadership, so to speak, the scribes and such, they were the religious leaders of the day, they had a problem with the Lord Jesus, and then he was dealing with um, some of those that were listening to him in the temple as he taught, and some believed, and so uh, we looked at that whole thing, went through that, and we saw there was a progression here that the Lord had to speak to them about something. And the Lord had to um, uh, um, put his finger on some things in their lives because they had a belief and yet there was no repentance. We saw that there's something missing here because it ended up they got uh, their pride uh, came into play and they uh, argued with the Lord and then started to insult the Lord and ended up throwing stones at him. And we saw that, well, that's not a real good belief system right there. There's something wrong with that, and yes, it was the problem of um, there was no repentance of sin, or they had not that idea of it. They were proud of their heritage, and the Lord tells us in another portion of the Bible to pay no attention to endless genealogies and, and so on. Uh, and they were doing that. They were saying, we're of Abraham and such, and that we aren't this and we aren't that. We are elevating themselves. That's pride is self-deception. It elevates an individual. They did not understand who this was that was doing these miracles and such and all these wonderful things before them. They didn't understand that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. They saw the miracles that he did as just nothing. When yet the Bible itself here in John chapter 21, I think it is, talks about the miracles that Jesus did to, uh, to show that he is indeed the Son of God. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that believing uh, you might have life through His name. And uh, so we see that taking place. And then He, at the end here of the chapter, and getting near the end, He says to them, and make, there's a couple of uh, declarations of deity here. And He, he, he uh, refers to Himself as uh, the I Am earlier on. And, uh, um, and He says it again in verse 58 Verily I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, the Pharisees, and what Pharisees will do is there's not much grace in that system, okay? It's all a bunch of rules and stuff, and you've got to live up to it. Nobody can live up to it. Therefore, everybody but them is uh, kind of lower, eh? And one of the things that was in, they take, would take some of the um, Bible, uh, um, some of the laws of God, and pervert them and such. But the, one of the laws, it says back in um, the Old Testament, that... If someone declared themselves to be God or so on and so forth like that, they were to be stoned and put to death. So they were to take up stones and throw them at Jesus because they knew what he meant when he said, Verily I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Referring to Exodus chapter 3 verse 14, when uh, uh, Moses was talking to the Lord at the burning bush. And he says, Who shall I say has sent me? He says, I am that I am. Okay, and then verse 59 then they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself. Now, I want to draw some, your attention to that word hid, hid himself right there. Um, some get an idea that what Jesus did, he was maybe, was he afraid of them? He went and hid under the pew or he went and hid in the closet or something. That's not the idea that's being put forth here. Uh, there's an interesting thing at the end of this verse as we see, we'll go on, we'll deal it with it as soon as we're done with this one. He hid himself and went out of the temple. 
Now, it wasn't that fear or something like that. You remember uh, in Luke, uh, is it 22 or 24, I forget, I think it's 24, where uh, there was two walking down the Emmaus Road, and the Lord Jesus met with them and walked with them. They didn't understand who that was. Why? Because he hid himself from them. They didn't understand who he was. I think that's what took place here. Mm -hmm. And if that's what took place here, this is an amazing, amazing miracle in itself. Okay? That they didn't recognize him or could not recognize him. He wasn't hiding because he was afraid. Of, he wasn't afraid of anything or anybody, was he? He would just stand and say, well, this is what it is, guys. This is the truth. You hate me because I tell you the truth. He hid himself. Okay. Um, likely, it was, it was like the Emmaus Road. Likely that. And he went out of the temple. And look what it says next. Going through the midst of them and so passed by. Okay? Going through the midst of them. He just walked out like as if he was just another day and he just walked amongst them and walked right out and they didn't even know who or where and he just went out. I think that took place another time too, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, it did. But I want to draw your attention to those words uh, going through the midst of them and so passed by. Now, I find it interesting that um, that bit right there is incorrectly omitted from minority text Bibles. A lot of the newer kind of Bibles leave that bit out and they stop at temple. They say Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. What, did he hid himself and waited till they were all gone then he went out? Like it, leaves, it leaves something undone here. This was a miracle that took place. Mm -hmm. And the minority text Bibles say that, uh, I don't know, we don't, we don't put that in there, but the majority text Bibles does. We have that in our Bible right here. In the old King James, and actually the new King James, the 21st century King James, the Geneva Bible, uh, all those ones have got this in there because they're from the majority text and they've got all of the verses. Okay? It's very important uh, that that's in there. Going through the midst of them, he hid himself, he was not recognizable to them, went out through the midst. So you see, a miracle then is denied if you're referring to one of the newer uh, uh, versions, a minority text Bible. Okay, Just I throw that in there. Again, it's very important because look at chapter 9 now. What's the first thing that we're told? And as Jesus passed by, the same words as was used at the e very end of chapter 8, and so passed by. Okay, he was just going on his way. There he goes. Okay, So let's get down to that and have a look at... Um, have a look at uh, chapter 9, see how far we get. Um, it's quite a big uh, chapter, um, but uh, we'll have a look and see what we can do here with the bit of time that we have. Um, <clears throat> over in uh, John chapter 10, verse 22, it tells us that it was winter. Okay? It was winter time in, over there. I like guess they don't get the snows like we do, but they might get some. The temperatures would change, the weather would, would change in that. It was a winter time. And we could, if we could, uh, 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 I'm not sure what month it was, so we can't get into that. It's winter, but it's interesting to note it says in John chapter 10 that it was winter. And where is the Lord Jesus in John chapter 12? That's only three chapters away from us. Where is he? He's in the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus and he's in that house and then he was about to go into the, into the city at the triumphal entry. Okay, That's the week of the cross at, at chapter 12. So we're getting up there. We're getting on. So this is in the, in the winter time. Now it was in the month, our month of April that he would have entered into the city like that. So he's somewhere probably in what we would call our New Year, somewhere in there. So he wasn't that far away from the cross. And yet, and this is just another rabbit trail for us, and yet when we look at all of the um, things that are done and said, if we look through our uh, harmony of the Gospels and all the teachings of the Lord and all the things that happened, all the things that he did, and they're all numbered and such, and, uh, from chapter 12 on, or is it from here on, I can't remember, there's like a hundred different teachings and things to consider. That's a lot of stuff when he's almost to the cross. <clears throat> the Bible is amazing, folks. It's just so much depth and detail into things. But let's get back into this 
chapter 9, and as Jesus passed by, so he's leaving now, he walks through the crowd of the people that were going to stone him and such, and they can't touch him, they can't do anything to him, except uh, God would allow them. And he would allow them to take hold of him and nail him to the cross down the road yet. And we could take a, 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 a bit of a, a, a application for ourselves. You know, if you're walking with the Lord and there's no, uh, uh, no sin in your life as far as, you know, uh, obvious uh, and, uh, sin in that, you're walking with the Lord, there's not much can happen to you that the Lord doesn't know. Isn't that right? You are under, basically under the umbrella of His protection. And things can happen, though. You've read the book of Job. You understand that bad things happen to good people. But God is in control, and His ways are higher than our ways. And the enemy can't touch you unless God says that that's okay, that He can do that. But it's for our good, for some reason, something like that. Eh? God is just God, that's all. But let's get the look at this as Jesus passed by. As he passed by, went by past these people, by the crowds, outside of the temple. Now, because he had to go from this area, the woman's court and the treasury, and I think he went out through here. I'm not sure, but I think I don't know if there's a door here or where it was. He's going out now, he's going into the courtyard up this way. Okay? And what's out in that area? You remember over in the book of Acts, is the chapter three that uh, Peter and John went up to the temple to pray. And as they went up there, there's a, a man who's lame was there and was asking about alms. The lame and the blind and all these people with problems like that would be there outside the temple. I'm not sure if it would be in the courtyard or even outside of that. I don't know. And they would be uh, um, asking for help because people are generally going up to the temple uh, for their worship and such. And... The, a lot of people coming and going, so the, the uh, beggars would be there, okay? And Jesus, it says here, he saw a man. Now, I wonder why just this one guy, maybe he was the only blind beggar there. Maybe he was the only guy there that day. Maybe there might have been a number of, a number of them, and he chose that one to deal with. Do you ever wonder why did God call me. You ever wonder that? You ever wonder that? that? All the people around us that are unsaved and yet here I am saved with the knowledge of Christ and of salvation. Eh? Isn't that something folks? Yeah, that's the grace of God. But it's, not, it's for us not to keep it. Get it out there and tell others so they can have that chance. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man. I like to think of that and whatever we do Whatever we do in life, it says whatever we find to do, let, uh, do, it with, uh, do it heartily, it's unto the Lord. But he saw a man, he saw a, an individual. You could say he saw a person, he saw a man, a woman, a child. And he sees you and he sees me and he always does and his eye is always upon us. You ever feel that you're kind of by yourself and uh, nobody knows, nobody cares and that may be so, but God is there, eh? For the Christian, he's there, he's with us. And he makes known his presence by the things that he does. But he saw a man who was blind from his birth. It was at one time, there was a blind baby born into this household. And it would be an amazing thing, it's a miracle, a, a, a birth took place and such, but the child was blind. Now that would cause a little bit of concern for the family because... What can a blind person do? Back in those days, what would they be able to do? Nothing but beg. To the blind man, a blind baby is born and grows up to be a beggar. There he is, a blind beggar. You kind of put yourself, and we should put ourselves in other people's shoes and just think about that, growing up as a child, not seeing, not knowing. Kind of like being on the lower rung of the social ladder. One who's always dependent upon others and such. And that would just pound him down. And there he is, just outside the temple. And Jesus, it doesn't say that he asked anything of the Lord. Not like the, the man when Peter and John went up to the temple and asked him for alms. And I don't think it's, he doesn't say that he did. 
Jesus saw him. He sees people in their troubles and their difficulties and such. And so we have in chapter 9 the whole account of this thing where the man is, fine, is brought to a place where he can see physically and then later on we'll get, we get, we'll get it to today that he believes and trusts in the Lord Jesus. That's the, that's the ultimate goal in it. So we see this one who was blind from his birth. In verse 2, And his disciples asked him, okay, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Well, that's a funny kind of thing, isn't it? How did this man sin before he was born? So he must have existed before that. Well, there are kind of religions and stuff that believe that kind of stuff and that kind of nonsense and such. And you'll find later on, uh, I forget where it is, I just read it recently, about, I think it was the Pharisees believe such a thing too, and they, and they say something to Jesus. I'm sure we'll get to that. But just think about it. There's a complete misunderstanding of, of God's doing, of what sin is, how it came to be, and was it his parents' fault that he was born blind? Well, I don't know. The Lord tells us something else though. But people blame God for everything usually, don't they? In this case, God did do this. You say, well, that's terrible. How could God be... Wait a minute. The Bible says that His ways are above ours. Do you understand everything about God? Anybody here or out there, you understand everything there is about God? It's impossible because He's an infinite being. We have a finite brain. We can't. We cannot comprehend what God is like. He does things that we would say, oh, I wouldn't do it that way. And he does things, go read the book of Job. And you'll see some things about God. And he never once apologizes to Job, because he doesn't have to, because he's God Almighty. Amen? Amen? He doesn't have to apologize for anything, but if you trust in him, you believe in him, you walk with him, you might have some things that happen to you. He is the potter. And we are the what? The clay, and he's molding us. Okay? Just keep that in mind as we go through life. It's nice when things work out. Okay? Uh, not all bad things is because of sin. Uh, God's ways are so far above ours. And Jesus answered, in verse 3, and Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him the activities, the actions, the things that God does is going to be seen in this individual. The Lord knew that this baby was going to be born blind and it was going to bring glory to Him at some point. And that's the, the purpose of the whole thing and the purpose of our very existence is to bring glory to God. We should be shouting Amen. But that's what it is. That's why we exist. Why am I here? To bring glory to God. Honor Him in all that you do. In all your ways. And the grace of God, as someone said, we are trophies of God's grace, those that are saved. And if you're not saved, you're not born again, you need to be. Because you'll not see God. You'll end up in hell. You'll stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment and you'll be cast into the lake of fire. It's a horrible thing. So I don't believe that. You will when you're there. It's too late. Okay? You need to trust in him now. But Jesus answered, said, his parents didn't sin, this man didn't sin. It basically, it's for the glory of God. It's just God's working here. Some things we don't understand. And in verse 4, we see, I must work the works of him. To work, to perform, to do, to have activity. And we are to have activity too, aren't we? We are to be doing for the Lord out in our lives. Not to gain... Uh, 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 privilege with him or whatever you call it but just because he's God and we love him and we want to do something for him I must work the works of him that sent me while in his day Jesus Christ was sent sent here to this world that the whole world might be saved John chapter 3 it's around verse 17, 18, 19 in there the works of him that sent me while in his day the night cometh when no man can work. So while we can, while we have time, we need to do for the Lord. And we need to speak about the Lord Jesus. 
you know that there is coming a time when this Bible will be outlawed. When the, the, to talk about Jesus Christ and the things of God will be outlawed. You don't think the Antichrist is going to come upon this earth and say, oh, that's fine, yeah, go ahead. He is so opposed to God, and we're seeing it today, and they're beginning to set up that particular kingdom that will rule the earth, okay? And it's not friendly to God, okay? Read uh, Psalm, is it chapter 2? tells you about it. So we must, while we're allowed, while we can, uh, not to say that there won't be underground things in that, we won't need to get into that, but it could be that the Lord is referring to perhaps death. When we our lives end, 10 out of 10 people die, right? We're all going to meet it someday, we're all going to buy it, or it's all going to come, it's, it's, it's going to happen, whatever, by whatever means, I don't know, whenever you don't know, it's going to happen. And one of the things, I, we stop and think about this, one of the things that I find a concern for myself is if I drop dead today and be standing before the Lord and just be like, oh, I wish I had of fill in that blank. You fill in that blank. I wish I'd have been more fill in that blank. I wish I had done more for the Lord. I wish I had spoke up. You know what I mean? He says, while it's Jesus Christ is an example for us, okay? How to serve the Father, how to serve. And, and we must work the works of Him that sent me. We've all been sent. If you're saved, He kept you here uh, for a purpose. He gave us a ministry of reconciliation that others would be reconciled to God. Hand out tracts, talk to people, okay? There's coming a time when you can't work either death or it'll you know, be outlawed or whatever. Verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am. He said that twice. I am, I am. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Yeah, and John uh, 3.19 tells us that. And John 8.12, he told them earlier, he said, I am the light of the world. It's interesting to note, though, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, he's talking to his disciples and he says, Ye are the light. See, Jesus is gone from the scene, isn't he? He's gone off the scene. We know that the Spirit of Christ lives within us. We know that. It's like we look and he showed us the picture in nature. The picture's there. The sun, we look today, is a beautiful sunny day. And that sun in the sky is the brightest thing around. It's a picture of Christ himself. And it's going to go across there and it's going to go down. And it's going to be gone off the scene. And then there's going to be a moon that reflects the light from the sun upon this uh, darkened world. That's the believers, that's the church. The moon is a picture of. It's a dead planet, it has no light of its own, only reflects the light of the sun upon this world under judgment. And we are the light of the world. Stop and think about it for a minute. That's pretty sobering. It's a pretty uh, heavy duty thing. Uh, as believers, as a Christian, somebody who's trusted, trusted in Jesus Christ the Savior, we are now the light. Not saying that we're God, we're not saying that at all. But we have Him within, and we have the knowledge of the Scriptures and how a person can be saved. Somebody has said that um, Christianity is the world's best kept secret. Because <laughs> not all Christians talk about it. Not all Christians share it. There's people around about us and everybody has a sphere of influence. And there's people around in your sphere of influence that have never heard about Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never said anything to them. Maybe you've been quiet about it. Maybe you've never put a tract out or something. We ought to be working well while we can. Jesus says, He's the light of the world. And He says, Matthew 5.14, Ye are the light of the world. Okay? It's given to us. And when He had thus spoken, now let's look at this. He came to that man... There's the blind man, and uh, we aren't told if the blind man was standing or sitting, or did Jesus sit down? Maybe he sat down. It doesn't say he bent down and took some clay. Maybe he was sitting, and it was within reach. I don't know, and I don't know if it even matters. I like to think, I'm just thinking, maybe he was sitting down. He just got right down with his level. God came right to our level, didn't he? To save us. And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. Okay, uh, this is the Lord. Now, there wasn't anything wrong with his spit. <laughs> Ours might have germs and things like that. 
but his didn't have anything uh, uh, wrong. Maybe maybe it's our germs in our gut for our, our digestion and stuff. And that. But just stop and think about it. He took some clay from the ground, spit on it, and then mixed it in his probably in his hand or maybe on the ground and made a kind of a, a gooey kind of paste. Okay. Then then what does it say he did? And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. He just took a little bit and just dabbed it on his. No, he did not. That word anointed right there means to rub in. Maybe he used his thumbs. I don't know. You ever have anything stuck in your eye? Everybody's had something in their eye. That's irritating, eh? He took that clay and he rubbed it into the man's eyeballs. Right on his eyeballs. Okay, this is, this is not comfortable. <laughs> this is very uncomfortable. And sometimes it's uncomfortable. The Lord wants to do something with us, but he wants to help us. And you have to go through that. And I wondered, why did he do that with this guy? Because if we stop and look at this man's life and the things he had to do, the end result at the end of the chapter, he believes in Christ. Maybe that's what it would take to get him to do that, to see if he would uh, 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 follow the Lord's uh, words and such. But he rubs this clay into the man's eyes. Now go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, I didn't get around to it, but I was going to look at a, a map of the temple area in Jerusalem. Maybe you can do that yourself. And to look and see how far it was from the temple area down to the pool of Siloam. Now, I think it was in the south there. And you stop and think about it. There's this guy, and he's got these things, this stuff rubbed in his eyes. It's probably not really comfortable. Maybe it was. I don't know. The Lord did it, so maybe it was just all fine and dandy. Probably not. It would help him to go and do as he was told. But he's got to go along. How did, how did he make his way through the city? Did he have a white cane? I don't know. Just feeling his way along. He probably knew what street to go on. He lived there all his life. But still, he's got a, a way to go. He's got to find his way. He'd have to ask for help. And where, where's this? And how, where am I? And get his way down to the Pool of Siloam. Now, we were going to look at this Pool of Siloam, but I thought we won't bother with that today. You can do that yourself. Look it up. And he said, verse 7, and he said to him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. The Lord Jesus sent him down to this pool. He went his way, therefore, as he was instructed, you see. He's, why did he, the Lord do this? This man had to do as he was instructed. He had to do this. Follow these steps. Do this thing. He says, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore. See, we read in one verse, we read about him being told, him going and coming back. But just stop it and, and walk along with him down to the pool of Siloam. You can't see anything. I think one of the most terrible things would be to be blind. You just can't see. And he's never seen anything. He's been blind from birth. Okay, we got that. And he goes down, he finds his way down to the pool, and he gets in the pool, um, or the edge of the pool, whatever, and washes, washes that mud out of his eyes. And guess what? It says he came seeing. Could you imagine, you wash the, 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 the clay and stuff out of your eyes, and you look up, and what do you see? Everything. I remember one time we were in New Brunswick and I had to get glasses, I think it was for the first time. They discovered, uh, we're taking some of the, uh, some of the, uh, some of the people from uh, the Bible school up to um, some place to do some singing thing. And it was uh, in the evening, and coming back it was raining, and I couldn't really see the signs that well. It was like, oh, there's something wrong. I don't see too well in the dark, and it's raining, and it's kind of blurry. I'm like, this is really bad. I didn't tell them I couldn't see <laughs> the signs where to go. But anyway, I went to the uh, the guy that looked at your eyes and that, and they prescribed me the glasses, and I got the glasses and that. And I remember putting the glasses on and stepping outside, and I just stopped. And this was in... Um, I think it was, in Wood, yeah, it was in Woodstock, New Brunswick, and I think it was, yeah. But you could see across the St. John River, normally if you could see, 
which I could never see, it was just kind of a blur. And El Crossing and I stood there on the sidewalk looking. I could see the trees, you could see birds flying, and there's the river. You could see way down the street, just, I'd never seen these things before. I never really knew it. it was like eyesight just getting worse and worse and worse and worse. But could you imagine what this blind man sees? But look at what he does. This really gets me. It says, he went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. What do you mean, came seeing? He came back to where Jesus was, up to the temple area. He, wanted to, he didn't want to stand around and he looked at all the sights. Could you imagine walking by, walking back, all the things he... How long would it take him to get back? I don't know, but he's looking at this and he's looking at that. But he heads straight back to the temple area to where the Lord Jesus was. Now, there's a lot in that for us. There's a, a message for us, no matter what the thing that comes upon us. The thing is to get back to where the Lord is. Go to where the Lord is. Get back up to the temple. Get over to that place or wherever it is. He came seeing. All the things that he would have seen. And verse 8 starts in the beginnings of some of the problems. Okay? Um, some of the problems that would be in this man's life and that came up when he came back up to that area. And I know we should probably stop now and take it up next week. But note that he came seeing. The thing that was upon his heart and mind was to go back up there to where Jesus was. And that's the thing that should be upon the heart and mind of believers is Jesus Christ to be where he is, to do what he wants me to do. This man was told, just go down to that pool and wash now. And, do that. and he did that, and he came back. Don't let anything draw you away, keep you away from the Lord Jesus. Don't let anything keep you from reading your Bible on a regular basis, and don't let anything stop you from having a time of prayer every day, and living for the Lord every day, and doing the works of God every day, doing something for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Something, something, something. As so one fellow said, we're in a war. At least you can do is carry bullets. Do something, you know. Do something for the Lord Jesus. Take that lesson from this man who was blind all his life. What does he want to do? I was blind, but now I see. And I want to go back and see that one. I want to be back up that area. Well, we'll take the rest of it up next week. It's enough things for us to think about. Our Lord is amazing. Our Lord is wonderful. How He brings sight to the blind and spiritual sight to those that trust in Him. God was manifest in the flesh. God went to the cross of Calvary for your sins. For my sins, for the sins of the whole world. He suffered death on that cross. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That's why you die. That's why we all die, because of sin. Way back in the Garden of Eden, we die because of sin. Jesus took it all upon Him. He died on that cross. He was buried and rose from the dead on the third day to show that sin is defeated and that He is indeed the Son of God. Believe in Him with all your heart. Trust in Him. Put your faith in Him and you'll be forgiven. You will be the child of God. All your sins are on Christ and you will not have any sins. Your, the slate is wiped clean, so to speak. And then when you die, when, when we will die, we'll close our eyes here and open them in an instant in the presence of God. Amen? What a blessing and a wonder it is to be a born-again Christian. You must be born again. You must be saved. Anyway, Lord bless you. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye now.